Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our 22nd uh, annual lecture by my account. Uh, once again, apologies for the delay and uh, for the change of panel on, on the debate earlier. We will have the following format. We'll have some introductory remarks by our sponsors. Uh, then I will introduce Mr. Hannan myself very briefly. Then Mr. Hannan will give us the annual lecture. Then we'll have a Q&A, then we'll have the annual uh, award ceremony, which will be very short, and then we'll invite you to an informal round of drinks and snacks, and then we'll, we can stay here until very late. Without further ado, I would like to invite the first sponsor, Mr. Peter Bardoni from the Natan Group. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're a very, very proud sponsor, uh, not just of general activities of the Liberal Institute, because of course the freer the market and the freer the society, the better it is for not only for everybody, but including also, of course, for our company. Um, but especially, uh, we're proud to sponsor of uh, Mr. Hanan's visit to the Czech Republic because finally, finally, for the first time probably ever in the Czech public sphere, you will learn that in addition to the Czech public uh, media image of a closed Brexit, that uh, uh, Brexit voters are those that want to uh, leave EU in order to get isolated on their insular history, there is such thing, and much more important thing, and those who are the driving force of the actual Brexit debate were those that uh, uh, were uh, for, for whom the European Union is a straitjacket and want to Brexit in order to have an open-minded policy of Britain to uh, to the rest of the world. And that's of course important for companies such as ours for two main reasons. Uh, the two main things we do is that we build buildings and we do private equity. Now, for buildings. If I may say, that is not a particular area we want to learn from Britain because um, my study of my long, long, many years of study of, uh, of Britain and the British uh, uh, housing market has revealed that we are actually much further down the path of, uh, of liberalisation or liberal uh, access to building buildings. In Britain, unfortunately, most Brits expect the state to provide housing for them, much more so than in the Czech Republic. So that's not necessarily the path we want to follow. But the, uh, the particular governance question, who is going to set the rules, that is hugely important for a private equity company because here is, that's the illustration of the difference between uh, uh, companies which are run by the, uh, by the rules of the stock market, let's call the stock market the European Union, it, they give you a manual, if you're a big company they give you a manual and this is how you're going to be governed internally as a company. These are rules, you have to show up uh, at all the meetings, you have to provide all the reports that nobody reads, and that's the idea of a, of, a, of a European Union. As opposed to a private equity company, where basically uh, it's often smaller companies that require ad hoc solutions for their particular problems, and given the particularities of what they produce and what market they move on, they decide on their own governance structure. And that's the idea of a private equity company, that finds what the optimal governance structure is. So we basically, on a smaller scale, deal with the same kind of issues that Daniel and uh, the whole uh, debate about the European Union and the future and the questions of governance deal with. So we have the both macro and micro scale, and therefore we find a union, but not European Union, but union of ideas. Thank you very much. Next up, Mr. Mittelmann from the Expo Bank, please. You have the floor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for us to be second time in a row partner of such an event. Uh, I would like to welcome all of you and Mr. Hanan here in Prague. I'm sure uh, you will enjoy today's very interesting lecture. And uh, I wish all of you a very interesting and pleasant evening. Thank you. And next up, Mr. Bill Wirtz of the Consumer Choice Center, please. 
Yes, thank you, Martin. Um, I work as a policy analyst for the Consumer Choice Center. The Consumer Choice Center is an NGO which defends the right of the consumers to make their own choices on a free market. What we do is we say that consumers are actually pro-innovation, they want new products, and they want affordable prices for them. Unfortunately, we find that in Brussels, more and more politicians are unfortunately opposed to those ideas. I'm just giving you a very brief example on one of the campaigns we work on right now, which is called Hands Off My Cheap Flights. The Dutch government right now, in the council, suggests that every single flight you take should have an additional 7 euros added to it. That's 14 euros if you take a round trip. And we say that if you're from Finland, or you're from France, or Belgium, the countries that support this tax, that might not be too much money for you. But for many low-income consumers, they will feel the effect of that. People who want to just visit their uh, children for when they graduate at university, people who want to visit their boyfriend or girlfriend, those people will be the real ones affected. And then what happens when people lose purchasing power and they have less means of buying, they, they put on their yellow vests or they get upset at protests and politicians go, oh, what happened? How could it be? So what we do right now is have campaigns on different issues, being in harm reduction, cybersecurity, and also uh, consumers being able to afford new and innovative products. That's what we try to defend. We would also like to thank Dan Hannan, who's been supportive of our message uh, on, on different campaigns, and we hope that in the future we'll have more politicians like him who will be supportive of, of our campaigns. So if you'd like to find out more about us, uh, you can visit our website, consumerchoicecenter.org, where you can also make a donation uh, uh, for our new campaign. Um, I would like to thank Martin um, as well. He's been very supportive in uh, giving us resources and helping us out and on, on different issues in Brussels, and navigating that city has been uh, uh, a trouble from the start, so we appreciate every help we can get. So thank you so much and enjoy your evening. So now you will have to put up with me for a couple of minutes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Bartoni, Mr. Mittelman, Mr. Bertz, presidents and other dignitaries in the audience, it's my duty and honor to welcome you to the 22nd Liberal Institute annual lecture. I don't want to keep you from listening to our highly esteemed guest tonight, but I would like to say a few introductory remarks. Our guest, Mr. Daniel Han, was born in 1971 in Lima, Peru. In his early 20s at Oxford, when John Major's government agreed to the Maastricht Treaty, he set himself out on a lifelong campaign to get Britain out of the European Union. And the, in the early 1990s, this seemed like a fool's quest. Virtually nobody was on Daniel Hannan's side. But little by little, concession by concession, persuasion by persuasion, he was getting the referendum one step at a time. In 1999, he was first elected to the European Parliament. At that time, the Conservatives sat with the European People's Party. That means for the Czech audience, with the likes of Mr. Niedermeyer or Mr. Zdechowski. You can see clearly that these don't really match well. Daniel Hannan was later expelled from this group for pointing out that a majority vote is not the same thing as a rule of law when that majority vote is used to disregard the Parliament's own procedures. He pushed the Conservatives to leave the European People's Party, which they finally did, and established the new European Party, the Alliance of Conservatives and Reformists for Europe. In Europe, sorry. The Czech Republic, through Mr. Toplanek, Mr. Zaharil, among others, had a hand in helping to build, to establish this new European political party. Then Hanan was then, for many years, the general secretary of this alliance. He and his colleagues met regularly to discuss how to get Britain, how to get the referendum in Britain. They pushed the Conservative Party from the inside and from the outside, until David Cameron finally gave way and promised the referendum if the Conservatives win the next general election. Daniel Hannan recruited Matthew Elliott as the CEO of the Leave campaign. <coughs> Conservatives won the election. David Cameron made good on his promise, made good, made good on his promise, and called an in or out referendum. And the rest, as they say, is history. The Financial Times says Daniel Hannan is the brains behind Brexit. The Guardian writes Daniel Hannan is the man who brought you Brexit. 
But what's next? Will, what will the, the United Kingdom do after Brexit? What should it do? Is there even going to be a Brexit anyway? Daniel Hannan has been a member of the European Parliament for 20 years now. He's running, or as they say in Britain, standing for a seat again. This year's election might be the toughest yet, as the Conservatives are under an immense pressure from the Brexit party. We are all the happier that with just one week to go, at a crucial time in his party's and his country's history, Mr. Hannan found the time to be with us to be with us tonight here in Prague. Daniel Hannan is an author of numerous books. I haven't read them all, but those that I read, those that I did read, I highly recommend. To name just a few, the plan 12 months to renew Britain about liberalization and British policy. We could uh, use a couple of these ideas in Czech policy as well. Books called Why Vote Leave and What's Next about the referendum and about what's next. Uh, the latest book, How We Invented Freedom and Why It Matters, about the greatest export England gave to the world, liberalism and democracy. He's also a regular columnist and commentator in various old and new media outlets and an eloquent speaker and debater. I myself translated many of his articles and speeches, which I hope served for their readers as a gateway drug to libertarian Euroscepticism and to libertarian thought in general. No party is Eurosceptic while in office. Our esteemed guest calls this phenomenon Hannan's first law of politics. If you look at various Eurosceptic parties across Europe, you will realize how robust this law is. But does it also apply to the Conservative Party today? Daniel Hannan is a great intellectual, a real gentleman, a Shakespeare fan, and a libertarian optimist. In 2017, he established the Initiative for Free Trade, a British think tank that promotes a worldwide liberalization of international trade. Together with the Cato Institute and nine other think tanks, they published a draft US-UK free trade agreement, which frankly should be signed as soon as possible. Then both countries will win bigly. Daniel Hannan also started two non-political hashtag campaigns. Hashtag Anamishes Lemon claims that lime is always preferable to lemon. Nothing, hashtag nothing escapes Shakespeare is, is here to convince us that before Simpsons did first, Shakespeare did it first four centuries ago. In the Shakespeare play called Cymbeline, one of the character, one of the characters says, Britain is a world by itself, and we will nothing pay for wearing our own noses. So we can see nothing, not even Brexit escapes Shakespeare. And with that, I'll leave the floor to Mr. Daniel Hammond. Thank you, Dr. Ford. Well, Martin, thank you for your very generous words. Uh, thank you, of course, to the sponsors. I always think it's terribly important to stress that, not only for sponsoring tonight, but thank you to all of you here tonight who work in the private sector. Uh, I don't know how it is in the Czech Republic, but in the UK, politicians are very good at saying thank you to nurses and teachers and doctors and soldiers, and quite right, so we should. But I wish we would also find time to say thank you to the people who generate the surplus that pays for all of the nurses and the teachers and the soldiers and the doctors and us. So on this occasion at least, thank you to the sponsors, uh, and thank you to everyone else involved in free enterprise. And thank you to the Chevro Institute. It's lovely to be back in this building. Thank you for hosting us. It's great to be back in this city. I had the extraordinary and formative experience of coming to Prague at the beginning of 1990, in that strange period when free elections had been scheduled but not yet held. <laughs> It was, my, it was my gap year, as it's called in the UK. I had left school and not yet gone to Oxford. If you were wondering why, as an undergraduate, because you were just hearing from Martin, I decided to make Euroscepticism uh, such a big part of my political life, a lot of it had to do with this city and the mood in this city at that time. You're, in most cases, I think, too young to remember this. I think one or two of you who may have been Politically, I, I, my, my friend Vondra was uh, old enough to be around at the time of the revolution. 
But one of the things that was unmissable when you were here was the power of the argument of patriotism. That what was motivating people in their revolutionary desire for freedom, and property rights, and the rule of law, and all the rest of it, was fundamentally a belief that the country should no longer be occupied by a foreign country, but should be free to live under its own laws. And that if you had that, all of the other good things would follow. I spent six very happy months in Central and Eastern Europe at the beginning of 1990. I came across the same pattern everywhere, in Poland, in Romania, in Hungary. And so when I got back to the UK, I found it very difficult to buy the idea that the nation state was finished, that patriotism was a discreditable force, that people who believed in self-government were one step away from fascism or ethnic hatred. Because I've seen the power of patriotism as an ally of freedom and of the rule of law, and I saw it here on these streets. In 1942, Charles de Gaulle made a broadcast from occupied Britain, uh, sorry, from Britain to occupied France, in which he said something that to the modern ear sounds a little jarring, but that uh, at the time was unremarkable. He said, for me, sovereignty and democracy are the same thing. Moi, la souveraineté nationale se confond exactement avec la démocratie. He went on to say it was all about a government, a government for the people. Now, that to us now seems a slightly odd thing to say. And yet, to the audience at the time, that would have been the most natural culmination of democratic thinking for the previous couple of hundred years. To the audience at the time, who believed that they were fighting for the restoration of national sovereignty and democracy in occupied Europe, it was an obvious linkage to make, as it would have been the past generation. Government of the people, for the people, by the people. When the radicals in the 18th and 19th century began to make this extraordinary argument that people should make their own laws, that we were not just the property of dynastic families and monarchies, that in some way governments should be answerable to the people, they immediately found that they had raised the question, what people? In other words, within what unit is the democratic process to play out? And in the end, they came up with what is surely the only plausible answer to that question. Democracy works in a unit where people feel that they have enough in common with one another to accept government from each other's hands. You have to have a sense of affinity, of allegiance, of shared loyalty that will allow you to sustain an open society and a liberal democracy. Put it another way, democracy needs a demos, a unit with which we identify when we use the word we. Take the demos out of democracy and you are left only with the crafts, you are left only with the power, the power of a system that has to compel by law what it dare not ask in the name of patriotism. This fundamentally was always my objection to the idea of turning Europe into something like a country. There was no European demos. There was the institutions of statehood. The EU had, starting with the Maastricht Treaty, acquired all of the attributes and trappings of being a, a nation. It had got its own parliament and its own head of state and its own national anthem and its own passport and its own flag, its own border force, its own currency. But almost nobody thinks of himself as a European in the same sense that somebody might think of himself as Portuguese or Hungarian or Swedish. Except, of course, in Brussels, where there are many people who take the, the question, where are you from, as a kind of microaggression and get very <laughs> upset to be asked. Patriotism gets a very bad press in Brussels. And where I work, uh, patriot is a uh, 
is a swear word. People spit it out. Populist, nationalist, patriot. They, it's as though a I don't know if, when you were a teenager, if you were ever at a party and you mistakenly took a swig from the beer can that was being used as an ashtray. That's how they, that's how they pronounce the word. Right? And yet, imagine a world where you didn't feel those bonds of loyalty that attach you to your fellow citizens. Imagine a country where you didn't have that sense of common identity, of shared affinities. My patriotism is why I pay taxes to support people I've never met. It's why I obey laws even when I think they're bad laws. It's why I accept election results even when my party loses, which, as Martin was suggesting, is just as well at the moment going in to these elections. If you look at a place where there is no national loyalty, the places with the most artificial boundaries, the Syrias and the Iraqs and so on, you see what happens when people feel no sense of connection one with another. Or, to put it another way, if you look at where the flows of population are in the world, where are the mass migratory pressures, overwhelmingly it is from artificial and arbitrary states towards nation states. I can't stress this point too strongly. We are regularly told the nation-state is backward-looking, it's a 19th century construct, it's artificial, we move beyond that. Uh, nationalism is, is one step away uh, from violence and <coughs> warfare. Actually, the worst and most violent ideologies have all claimed to be bigger than the nation-state. Nazism, Communism, Islamic fundamentalism, now they all make the same claim, which is we don't recognize territorial jurisdiction. We answer to a higher law. What was the signature act of the Iranian Revolution? First thing they did, the seizure of the U.S. Embassy, right? Think of the symbolism of that act. If the U.S. were to invade Cuba tomorrow, we could reasonably surmise that diplomats would be safely evacuated through neutral countries. That's what happens. And what they were saying is, we don't recognize your laws at all. We answer to a higher power than you. Your notions of state sovereignty and territorial jurisdiction mean nothing to us. And that was how they carried on from that beginning, sponsoring militias, terrorist movements from London to Buenos Aires. The most dangerous force in human affairs is always the one that begins by thinking that it is bigger than the old Westphalian system of international law. Or oh, flip it around. There is no surer defense of freedom than the nation state, rooted as it is in genuine and organic loyalties. I consider myself a liberal conservative. Right? I'm very, very happy to speak at liberal institutes and conservative organizations as well. And I was, I was listening yesterday to the great philosopher Roger Scruton talking about the case for the nation state. And he said, it's about the first person plural. We need to have a sense of we, absolutely right. And as I listened to him, I thought you could, you could summarize the great philosophies, the great ideologies in pronouns, or in pronouns and verbs, right? If the ethic of libertarianism is, I may, and the ethic of socialism is, you must, then the ethic of conservatism is, we should. It makes an appeal that is not legal, that is enforced, but that is rooted in a sense of common values. We have enough in common watch the same kind of TV when we were growing up, we, have, we speak the same language, we know the same songs, we feel an obligation one to another. Now, to say that that, therefore, is one step away from ethnic hatred and war, I think is the most extraordinary misunderstanding. And is best answered uh, with a line from the brilliant aphorist and theologian G.K. Chesterton, who said, to condemn patriotism because it can lead to war, is like condemning love because it can lead to murder. Try living in a world 
without either of those things. Now, none of this should need saying. In most countries, in most continents, this kind of is, is accepted, except in the European Union, which is going determinedly in the other direction. Uh, after the UK referendum, uh, Guy Verhofstadt, the Liberal leader, the former Belgian Prime Minister, came to make a speech at the London School of Economics. And he said, the future is with empires. And Britain has made a terrible mistake by excluding itself from this voluntary empire that is taking shape in the form of the European Union. Now, I would say that just as history, that is an extraordinary misreading of the trend globally. When the, when the European Union was set up in the 1950s, there were 80 states in the world. Now there are 200 and growing. And that move towards more and smaller units has generally been accompanied by a move towards more democracy and greater prosperity. And for the most obvious of reasons, which is that decisions are better when they are taken closer to the people that they affect. There are still, around the world, lots of movements that want more political autonomy or separation for this or that union. There are very, very few calling for fusionism, calling for the, the putting together of entities into bigger blocks, except in the European Union. I have to say, I think that is an abandonment of what raised European civilization in the first place. It seems to me that the greatness of European culture lies precisely in its variety, its diversity, its plurality. There's something not just undemocratic and unmodern, but un-European in trying to merge the ancient kingdoms and republics of this country, of this continent, into a single country. Let me illustrate this with a little thought experiment. Suppose that you were a visitor from another planet, circling the globe 500 years ago, looking from the porthole of your flying saucer down at the Earth beneath. Who would you assume was going to be the dominant civilization of the second half of the second millennium. Right? I, I suggest to you that your eye would be drawn to the great civilizations of Asia, to the Ming and Mughal and Ottoman empires, to the extraordinary technological advantages that they had in the 15th and 16th centuries. Cartography, mathematics, sailing, paper money, gunpowder. Your eye may have then veered over to the broken, scattered tribes at the western tip of the Eurasian landmass. You would have assumed that their lot was to be the colonized rather than the colonized. You would have assumed completely rationally that the Chinese were going to sail around Africa and discover Portugal rather than the other way around. Why didn't that I have to be honest here, this is not an original theory of mine. I'm borrowing freely from an Australian historian called uh, E.H. Jones, whose, whose uh, theories were then taken to a much wider audience by Paul Kennedy in his Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. But essentially, the argument was this. The Mings and the Mughals and the Ottomans made the mistake of becoming centralized superstates. They extinguished enterprise, variety, the ability to trial and pilot new schemes, and they became highly taxed, rigid, and backward. Whereas precisely because Europe was not a single state, but was a plurality of competing states, there was always the freedom to innovate, to try out new ideas, to copy what your neighbors were doing. Even in the most explicit way, as when Peter the Great was sending out his agents to say, find out how the English can make their ships, find out how the Dutch build their cannons, to copy what worked best in a competitive spirit that fostered innovation, adventurism, and discovery. Now, I'm sure you've all worked out where I'm going with this argument. <laughs> you don't find very many mandarins in Beijing today, but you find plenty of them in Brussels. The European Union has decided to take the Ming Mughal Ottoman <coughs> towards more taxation, more centralization, and uh, elevation of official doctrine over the ability 
to innovate. And that's why, fundamentally, I think this project is going against the movement in human history. Which brings me to Britain having decided to step aside. Now, one of your sponsors was kind enough to say that the, the reality is a little bit different from the way in which it's portrayed in some continental media. I can't read Czech, but I have certainly found this in the continental media uh, where, where I can read it. The casual follower of the news might get the impression, first of all, that Brexit was a kind of British Trumpism, that it was uh, nativist, it was nostalgic, it was anti-immigrant, uh, and also that a consequence of it has been economic stagnation, uh, political paralysis, uh, scramble for foreign passports, disinvestment. Let me just tell you, as the uh, as Martin said, the person who appointed the chief executive of the Leave campaign, therefore has as much claim as anyone to be responsible for it. This thing of blackness, I acknowledge mine, says Prospero. <laughs> if we had fought the kind of angry, backward-looking, Trumpy campaign that Remainers imagined we had fought, we wouldn't have got close to winning. The only way that we could carry a majority of our countrymen was by being open internationalist and optimistic in our language, by holding out a, a, a picture of something better, a global Britain interested and engaged in the affairs of every continent, including Europe. I'll give you a, a rule of thumb, a heuristic, if we want to give it its pretentious name, here's a rule of thumb. If any Brit says to you, the Brexit vote was all about immigration, I guarantee that you are talking to someone who voted for no lever believes that. We know what it was about. Yeah, of course, immigration was an issue because we wanted control of our borders just as we wanted control of our laws and control of our democracy. But there was ample polling on this, including a huge exit poll of 12,000 people on the day, by far the biggest issue for leavers, way, way ahead of border control, was the principle that decisions should be taken more closely to the people that they affect. It was fundamentally a move away from centralization and a move away from the agglomeration of power in Brussels. Now, here's the interesting question. What has been the EU's reaction? Was there any acknowledgement that there might have been a criticism? I mean, I've been, as a member of the European Parliament, in the EU institutions for the three years since the vote. And by and large, there are three approved ways in which a good European can react to the Brexit vote. One is disbelief. Oh, it's never going to happen. They'll come to their senses. One is rage. Bloody idiots, they were led astray by demagogues and liars. And one is contempt. You just wait until this actually happens, then you're going to come crawling back. The one thing that you have, you, I've never heard, and I don't think it has ever been voiced by any Eurocrat, is anyone saying, oh, but I wonder why they voted. I mean, I, I wonder whether there's something we might have done differently in Brussels. I wonder whether other people might also have criticisms of the system that we've built here. I wonder whether there might be something in the idea that we have become a remote, self-serving bureaucracy cut off from the people that we purport to speak for. Of course you don't hear that. It's much easier to demonize Europe. It's much easier to say, anyone who disagrees with me is a racist or a bigot, rather than to look at whether there might be elements of misgovernment or fraud or remoteness that have triggered this reaction in the first place. I'll tell you another interesting thing. One of the issues that did come up in the campaign was a sense that the British establishment, the British political class, was acting in its own interest rather than in the, the broader interest. And I have to say, the Remain campaign operated in an extremely foolish way because they campaigned with effectively a series of letters and press releases from one day it would be uh, green you know, eco-pressure groups, the next day it would be uh, captains of industry, the next day it would be top civil servants, the next day it would be university vice chancellors. But it would always be the same uh, the same message, which is, leaving the EU would be very bad news for us. And 
even when they try to phrase this more broadly as being about the British economy, it will take moments on Google to reveal that all the signatories were receiving EU subventions. And so, of course, this, this reinforced the sense that people had that when you say this is a national interest, you mean it's in your, your own interest. And by the end of the campaign, there was a, a moment that became kind of iconic when Michael Gove, one of the Leave campaigns, was being presented with a series of forecasts by international and European think tanks about how terrible the impact of a Leave vote would be. And he started to say, I think people have had enough of experts from these think tanks with acronyms, you know, who, who don't set foot in the UK and who tell us what's going to happen. But the interviewer cut him off. So he only got as far as saying, I think people have had enough of experts. Right? And this then became a sort of symbol for the Remain campaign. Of, oh, these know-nothing, moron Eurosceptics, they, they think that the experts are no good. Oh, let's just, as a little exercise, see whether the experts got those economic predictions right. Okay, we're three years on. What were they saying? And what's actually happened? And I'm taking here the, not the predictions of the Remain campaign, fair enough that they can be partisan, of course they are, but the predictions of the Bank of England, of the Treasury, of the IMF, of the OECD. We were told that if we voted leave, the immediate consequence of a leave vote would be to trigger a recession. In fact, the UK has outgrown the Eurozone in the time since the vote. Now, it's continuing to be forecast to do so this year. Of the big economies in Europe, I mean, none of us is in great shape, but we are doing better than France, Germany, or Italy. We were told that if we, this was an official Treasury forecast, we were told that if we voted leave, it's nothing to do with actually leaving, just the, the, the shock of voting leave, that within two years of the referendum, in a best case scenario, unemployment would have risen by 500,000, in a worst case scenario by 830,000. Two years after the vote, unemployment had actually fallen by 500,000, and we had the best employment figures in our history. And that has carried on for the year since. There are now more people in work than at any moment ever in the past. We had new figures out today, another 65,000 jobs in the last month. There has never been better news in the employment market. We were told that if we voted to leave, there would be an immediate blow to the stock exchange. We weren't told that that would be the Italian stock exchange and that <coughs> the British stocks would be breaking every record. In fact, I, I, I could spend the whole of the rest of the lecture talking about this. Exports are up, manufacturing is up, uh, orders are up, consumer confidence is up, uh, growth, employment, any metric you like. The biggest one I would focus on, investment. Right? If people really were scared of the consequences of Brexit, we would not have been the single biggest destination for foreign direct investment in the world except China in the period since the late. So, maybe people were right to discount the dire predictions of the experts. Maybe people were right to trust to their own instincts and to the common sense views of their neighbors and to resist the hectoring and the bullying and the threats that they got from all the party leaders, all of the big banks and businesses, all of the think tanks, and yes, all of the experts. If you want to a summary of why Britain voted leave, I could do no better than to quote something written by the great conservative philosopher, the great Irish conservative philosopher Edmund Burke, in his reflections on the French Revolution in 1791. And this, by the way, I think is a great message for conservatives in any country. He said, because half a dozen grasshoppers concealed underneath the fern, make the field ring with their importunate chink, while thousands of great cattle take their repose in the shade of the British oak and chew the cud in silence. Pray do not imagine that those who make all the noise are the only inhabitants of the field. What happened? on the 23rd of June, 2060, is that the oxen showed themselves to be not only more numerous than the crickets, 
But why is it? Of course, the crickets are still shrieking furiously in protest. <laughs> and they've now got themselves into a position of being unable to hide their annoyance at good economic news. Right? Anyone here who is thinking of going into politics, bad luck. Right? There is no way that being annoyed about an economic recovery is ever going to convince voters uh, of anything. And yet, they got themselves into this extraordinary position that they were so determined that Brexit had to be a failure, that whenever there is uh, another set of good news on investment or whatever, their first instinct is to deny it uh, or uh, refuse to see it. So, where does all this mean? The crickets are shrieking in, in Westminster, the crickets are shrieking in Brussels. Of course, the EU is still trying to overturn the whole process. And it is doing so with the connivance, with the collaboration of a number of British politicians. There was a noticeable change in the whole course of the talks two years ago in the 2017 election. So we had, a, we had the referendum in June 2016. We then had a general election 12 months later. And at that general election, the Conservative government lost its majority. And from then on, members of parliament started making very public statements saying we will not leave without a deal. We will only leave on terms agreed with the EU. If you think about it, leave without a deal is, is another way of saying leave without permission. I, I mean, it's an extraordinarily tendentious way uh, of describing it. Well, of course, the EU responded to that change by making more unreasonable, more vindictive, more aggressive demands. Of course it did. Think about it. Think about any transaction you've ever been involved with in your life. Buying a car, or selling a car, or buying a house. Right? Imagine going in before the first meeting and saying, listen, uh, before we start negotiating, I just want you to understand that I'm not going to walk away. Right? Whatever happens, I'm definitely going to sign up to your terms. Or, or stay where I am. Right? I mean, so, for, of course, from the EU's point of view, they then have two very uh, agreeable outcomes. One is that Brexit is cancelled. The other is that we accept basically all of the costs of membership but give up our vote and our voice in the decision-making process. Ultimately, the British people have seen through that. And that's why you see this record polling for the Brexit party. And that's why, despite everything, again, despite everything you read in some of the media, there hasn't been any change in public opinion. If, the, if there was a... The, the opinion polls today are pretty much where the referendum was on polling day, and therefore the opinion polls today are better than the opinion polls were, if you see what I mean, because they had underestimated the leave vote three years ago. So, despite all of this pressure, no one has really changed their minds. In the end, we're going to have to sort this out by getting a different majority in Parliament. Only way to break the deadlock will be to have a majority in the House of Commons that is prepared to walk away from a bad deal. I can't tell you for sure what will happen at the next election. None of the parties is led by a, uh, well, actually, I'll put, it, I'll put it more strongly. Both the main parties, my party and the Labour Party, have chosen historically bad leaders. We've chosen two of the worst of our countrymen at this critical moment. So there is a, uh, an uncertainty about how that will play out. But I'll say this, you can't go back to how things were. Whatever now happens, the 2016 result can't be put back into the bottle. It's out there. And whatever relationship Britain has with its allies in Europe is not going to be on the basis of how things used to be before. I think the best case scenario, the best outcome, would be to have Brexit as a catalyst. As my friend Jan Zarudel is always saying as he tours Europe in his Spitzenkandidat capacity, to use Brexit as a catalyst for reforms of the EU as a whole. To use it as a way of devolving, democratizing, decentralizing powers. To try and get back to the idea of a Europe of nations, each one sovereign, each one living under its own institutions, cooperating where they need to, to be able to go their own way. Let me close because I want to leave time uh, for questions with words, since this is the liberal issue, words by the great liberal German economist Wilhelm Röpke, one of the first of his countrymen to see through the barbarism of Nazism, 
and one of the first Germans, indeed one of the first Europeans, to see where the European project was likely to end up. In 1942, he said, in ancient times, Strabo wrote of the many shapes of Europe. Montesquieu wrote of Europe as a nation des nations. He said, to try to meld Europe together and organize it as a bloc would be nothing less than a betrayal of the European patrimony, a betrayal of all the world for being carried out in the name of Europe. So let me leave as I began by recalling this city and the gradual struggle of this nation towards self-government. I don't think that the arguments we're having today are categorically different from the arguments that culminated in the June Revolution in 1848, or indeed in the restoration of national sovereignty in 1989. It's fundamentally about understanding that when you take control of your own destiny, you will be better off than when decisions are made by people who are invulnerable to the ballot box and immune to public opinion. National self-determination is the first step towards liberal democracy and an open society. That is the precious heritage that all of us have been fortunate enough to inherit from our own parents. Let's pass it on securely to our children. I think if, the, if there are enough questions, uh, feel free to raise your hands. Uh, we should have a microphone. Right. Oh, okay. So, well, I, 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 if um, you tell me, Martin, if we're running out of time, but otherwise I'll just take any, any points that people can see. Thank you. If not, then we'll call it an earlier evening. Yes. Do I see your hand up, sir? No? <laughs> no? Yeah, yeah. Okay. saying that it is better to have a friendly relationship with our immediate neighbours in an agreed way with some institutional reflections of, of that agreement than to, to start completely with nothing and, and have to build it up over many years. So the, the, the question is not whether you want a no-deal outcome as an end in itself. The question is, at what stage is the offer being made by Brussels so bad that you should be prepared to walk away? And as I say, when the talks began, I think we were heading towards a fairly equitable outcome because neither side wanted a rupture that would be uh, bad for economic growth, and, and but, you know, both sides wanted their citizens to be able to carry on, you know, uh, living in each other's countries and so on. There was quite a lot of, of congruence on the substance, 
uh, until the 2017 election, at which point the, uh, the Labour, SNP and Lib Dems and a handful of Conservatives were saying, we will not allow Britain to leave without a deal. Of course, the European Union then said, well, in that case, we want this and this and this and this. And some of what they put on the table was so speculative, so extreme, that they, they couldn't believe when it was accepted in the talks. And particularly, this is the what's called the Irish backstop proposal, which is really uh, an attempt to keep Britain in the customs union, in other words, in the common commercial policy with the common external tariff. Um, to, 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 to show what's wrong with the Irish backstop, imagine that this was any other country that the EU wanted to trade deal with. Imagine that it was Canada with whom they recently signed a free trade agreement. Imagine that the European Commission had said to the Canadian government, we will only sign a trade deal with you if you give us control of all of your trade with third countries in perpetuity. We will decide what trade deals you have with China, India, the United States. You won't have any input into that. That would be for us to decide. Oh, and we also want regulatory control of the whole of Quebec. They should follow our rules instead of yours. Oh, and at the end of that, we may not give you a trade deal. <laughs> I mean, it is absurd that this is even being discussed. And the truth is, it's being used in Britain by some people who don't want to live at all. And they, of course, are talking to people in Brussels who agree with them. And I think the most, if you want one, one quotation, that summarized, to understand the whole thing, something that Michel Barnier said, the, the chief EU negotiator uh, in 2016, he said, it was a, a, a private meeting with the, the other commissioners, and he said, I will have done my job if at the end the terms are so bad that the Brits would rather stay in. Well, of course, that's what the EU has negotiated. Now, any normal country in that situation should say, well, in that case, we're just leaving without a deal. But the trouble is that with the current parliamentary majority, we can't do that. And that's why, ultimately, I think this will have to be settled by a new general election. So. My name is Vito Dicho. Thank you for a great lecture. I'm a great question. Thank you. <laughs> campaigning for uh, also Czech Republic to, to leave EU and in some reason have a five-year term. <clears throat> and uh, I just recently saw your lecture, which was republished, and I think you translated a couple of years back together with Martin. Uh, and you were speaking at the European Parliament, and you were actually mentioning that the benefits of single market are lower than the costs, the regulatory costs uh, connected to it. So from that perspective, I mean, even applied to the Czech Republic, it, it, just that this kind of, kind of no-deal option basically becomes more economically viable than staying in the EU and taking on all the regulation. In other words, you know, the, the, the papers that you have to actually figure out on the borders are, are less burden, and the tax connected to transferring the goods over the borders is much less burden than the regular active burdens. Did I get your point right? And from that perspective, is not no deal actually a, a rational solution to the whole issue? Yes, it's very interesting. I mean, the, the, the point is that they weren't my figures, they were the European Commission's figures. Uh, admittedly from two separate studies. The European Commission did a study saying what are the benefits of the single market and what are the costs of regulation. And the first study found that the benefits of the single market were about 120 million euros a year. This was six years ago, whenever, whenever they did this thing. Whereas the, the cost of the regulation was 600 million a year. <laughs> so on the European Commission's own figures, the compliance costs were 500% of the advantages of, of easier trade. Uh, I mean, the, the reality is that if the Czech Republic or the UK leave the European Union, we're not simply going to have uh, a, a distant, friendly, South Korea type of trade agreement. I think the, the reality is we will be a little bit more economically integrated than that, just because of the, the, the percentage of our exports to go to the EU. So rather than looking at, at Japan or, or Canada, look at somewhere like Switzerland or Norway, where they broadly are in the common market but broadly outside all of the political institutions. Now, there is a tiny amount of extra paperwork. Neither of those countries is in the customs union. And as a result, both Norway and Switzerland, and Iceland and the other two EFTA countries, 
uh, they all have free trade agreements, for example, with China. Uh, and you know, they just signed one the other day with the Philippines. They have a, a wider range of free trade agreements than the European Union does. I can't help noticing that they're doing okay. I mean, the, the, the two highest standards of living in Europe in Norway and Switzerland, they're plainly managing to scratch out some kind of miserable, wretched half-existence outside the European Union. So, uh, my own view is that this is what we should have done from the beginning. We should say, let's, let's just join EFTA, or rejoin EFTA, because we were the, the country that founded EFTA in 1960. Let's rejoin EFTA and then tra transform it, because once you had, you know, EFTA at the moment has, what, you know, 12 million population, something like that. Once it had 75 million population, uh, the balance would be different and, and we could try to create a, a category in Europe for those countries that only want a market and not a political union. Uh, unfortunately, Theresa May had a different idea and, and decided to, in her mind that the whole thing was about migration and, and so she ruled that, uh, that, that possibility out. I still think it would be, from where we are, the most uh, logical way of reflecting a narrow referendum and keeping good relations with our friends in Europe. Yeah. I'm sure Mr. Commander already has the mic. Oh, okay, sorry, at the back. Yes, forgive me. say, let's carry on doing what we were doing before, but, but more. Let's have more military integration, let's have more fiscal harmonization, let's have more political union in, in, in the way in which we uh, conduct European Parliament elections and so on. Is that, I mean, you know, we will find out in about two weeks' time whether there's been any popular backlash against that. I, I suspect that for the first time at a European election we will see the election, the returning of a significant number of expressly anti-federalist, Eurosceptic candidates from left and right. Uh, but yes, the, the institutions themselves have been incredibly impervious to outside events, incredibly resilient, and in a way this is the, the problem. Uh, if, if the EU had shown any flexibility when the UK renegotiation was in 2015, the beginning of 2016, when David Cameron was trying to get a different deal, if he'd been able to come back with one power return, with just the, the recovery of one area of competence, you know, fisheries, or one thing, he'd have won the referendum. Because he'd have been able to say, look, we've established the precedent now, the flow of powers doesn't always have to be in one direction, it can come back as well. And people would have said, oh, great, okay, we can build on it. And he would have won three to one. But faced with the choice, the EU preferred to lose its second largest financial contributor than to allow any precedent of power being returned to the national level. 
And in the end, that's why Britain ended up leaving. It wasn't because we didn't try and argue our case. It was that for 40 years of membership, various attempts to reform and decentralize had gone nowhere. And in the end, we had to leave. And other countries may eventually find themselves having to make the same choice. One more in the middle, yes. So, thank you. So I had, I had two questions, but one of them you already answered. Uh, and the second one is, if you become the Prime Minister and join the EFTA, would you please be so kind and invite us to it as well? Did you remember? Well, I'm not going to be Prime Minister. I, I love my country too much to, uh, to do <laughs> such a thing. But, uh, but I, I do like the idea of an expanded EFTA. It may have different names being an option for every country in Europe. And this was, uh, before the Brexit referendum, this was something that European Federalists also used to talk about quite enthusiastically. Uh, they would say, we need to find a way of extending the market to countries that are politically unacceptable or that don't want to try. You know, Turkey, Ukraine, you know, Israel, Morocco, they will, uh, and, and actually, you know, wouldn't that be the way of solving everything? Wouldn't it be a great idea? if we could have a continental free market that stretched from Iceland to Armenia, within which there was free movement of goods and services, and then, you know, or 40, 45 countries, part of that is a big, broad common market. And then within that, a subgroup of, I don't know, 15, 20, 25, or how many countries that want political union and a single currency and a president and all the rest of it, doesn't that leave everybody happier? Federalists get what they wanted, which was a, a country called Europe, surrounded by a ring of friends who are trading with them, but outside their political institutions. If we had played Brexit differently, maybe that would have been the catalyst for it. Uh, this time, you know, I, I, I don't think it's going to work, but I hope that that will, will still come about, because it seems to me the obvious solution uh, to the tensions that will otherwise exist permanently. Question. <laughs> um, there are a lot of people they will, they will say, okay, you can, you can leave now, but the city of London will basically disappear. All the bankers will have to go to Paris, to Frankfurt, because of the passporting rights, because of the EU citizenship, and all these things. So, um, what do you reckon? Well, I, I would think you should look at what's happening. So, you can look at surveys saying, do you think it'll be a bad thing? Well, you can look at how many jobs are there in financial services in the UK. And there are many more now than there were three years ago. Now, of course, I cannot prove that there wouldn't have been even more without Brexit. But I can pretty comprehensively demonstrate that what we were told during the campaign, which is that hundreds of thousands of people would go from London to Frankfurt, that has palpably not happened. Uh, one or two went to Frankfurt and then realized that nothing is open at weekends, and so they came back again. And, fancy uh, relocating. And none of the big banks has gone. In fact, since the vote, we've had quite a lot of relocations by major financial institutions to London, including Deutsche Bank, including ING's headquarters, uh, Wells Fargo. This has all happened since the, since the vote. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I think it's what's in the background here. Um, the EU is refusing to have technical talks on most issues with the UK. Part of, part of the EU's negotiating stance is to try and make no deal as scary as possible. So they, they say, we will not have any technical discussions about veterinary checks or, or you know, aviation or whatever, except as part of an overall deal. In other words, it, it, it's, it's almost like threatening a blockade. But the one area where they dropped that was in financial services. And they, they basically, I don't know, summarizing it a bit, but they basically said, for at least the next couple of years, nothing will change. Uh, passporting, clearing, all of that will carry on as if you were still EU members. So the city of London was still in the EU. Now, maybe, I, 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 you know, I can be part of any of the talks, but maybe this is because they realized that when you cut yourself off from a resource, you're the loser. So there is no source of cheap money in the world like London. It may have occurred to people that at some point in the next year or two, people will want to get their hands on that money. 
For example, there may be a need urgently to recapitalize the Italian banking system or something. Right? In that situation, who else has the capital to do it? And this is the, the most fundamental point that you know, should have been obvious to all sides, but I've been amazed in the last three years by how many people have talked as though countries trade with one another out of kindness. <laughs> as though, as though uh, inviting customers is an act of generosity. You know, it, but that's really not the reality, as we all know. As Adam Smith said, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we get our dinner, but from their regard to their self-interest. It's not from the benevolence of the EU that we expect uh, financial uh, institutes on the continent to continue to be able to access London, but from their regard to their self-interest. Uh, is Mr. Barroso still an advisor to the British uh, Gold Tax? Yes, I mean, one of the biggest uh, sources of, of funds for the Remain campaign were the, were the very big mega banks, uh, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, uh, Citibank, and so on. And, and you can see why. I mean, over years, they have invested hundreds of millions of euros, huge lobbying operations to get rules that suit them. And they are very, very scared of having to start all over again with a different set of British regulations. <laughs> but from the point of view of the city of London in the long run, we're not competing against Frankfurt and uh, Paris. Uh, we're competing against you know, Shanghai, Singapore, New York. Ultimately, in order to make a success of Brexit, we need to have lighter regulation. And we need to be outside the EU's regulatory uh, control. And if that means some uh, additional uh, you know, paperwork when dealing with the EU, I think most people will, will tell you that it's worth it. Because we need to be where the customers of the future are. The people, of course, will be most resistant are the big established market players now. And by the way, you will find this in this country or any other country, whenever you perform, whenever you propose a big transition, however obviously it will be in the long-term national interest, there are always people who have learned to do very well now from the status quo. And however irrational that status quo is, they will dig in and defend it out of immediate self-interest. And because they tend to be the in, in the commercial world, the biggest companies, because they're, they're the ones who have done best, people listen to them disproportionately. But a politician, a decision maker, has to think of the startup, of the entrepreneur, of the challenger, has to think of the businesses that don't yet exist. And a successful country is the one where instead of allowing a stranglehold for the big corporates, you try and encourage the innovator of tomorrow. Well, if there are people who haven't asked questions yet. Hello, my name is Miji Malek. I'm from the University of Economics. And I was going to ask you what do you predict that will happen in the end of October? Uh, do you have any plan other uh, than anything what politicians are doing now in summer when they still have time or do you think they will be beginning as we see in the end of March? And how do you look that the referendum wasn't you know, like building law, it's advisory so politicians can say that um, yeah, thank you for your opinion, but I don't know, we will have the next referendum or it's just advisory. And also, do you think that uh, also no deal it's unlikely to happen because po other political politicians seem to allow it to? And I'm also against, I'm not uh, with the Europe Union, but I would. Uh, like you, if Great Britain stayed in Europe, because uh, Czech Republic needs uh, allies with European conservative groups, and also I think that we have to reform the European Union from the inside, inside and not outside. Thank you. If you... Well, I, I mean, on, on your last point, I'm, I'm strongly in favour of Czech conservatives, <laughs> the, the 
this is our sister party. I'm a, I'm a member of the Alliance of European Conservatives, so uh, I'm, I'm very happy to stand here and say please vote for them uh, next week. Look, on the, on the, the, the issue of referendums being advisory, of course that is true. Uh, and that is the fundamental problem. When you read all of these headlines about chaos or gridlock or political meltdown, I mean, as I hope I explained earlier, the country is not in meltdown at all. I mean, people are, you know, people are very content to spend, to go visit any part of the UK. There is a, 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 a good economic mood based on record job figures and, and, and strong growth. But there is a political crisis in Westminster, and it comes from exactly what you touched on. When MPs, three and a half years ago, voted to push the question of EU membership to the electorate at large, it never occurred to those MPs that they might not get the answer they wanted. And so they have now spent all the time since trying to wriggle out of the promise that they made, which was to accept the outcome. Of course, it has no legal force, but it does have a very strong political force when every leading politician promises in advance that they will do whatever the country votes. And they're now uh, on the left trying to get out of, of what they promised. So I think there is a contradiction. But whereas usually when people say there's a, when British people say there's a contradiction between our parliamentary system and referendum, what they usually mean is we shouldn't have any more referendums. I would say the opposite. I would say, yeah, solve that contradiction by giving referendums a constitutional place in the way that the Swiss do. Make them a regular way of doing business. <coughs> ask people their opinion, especially at local level. Ask their opinion about tax rises. Ask their opinion about buildings. Ask their opinion about regulations on noise and what time of day you're allowed to play music and all of this at the, at the micro level. Because you then end up with a more intelligent, more engaged, and happier electorate. And you end up with smaller government because the real power of the referendum is to block things. It's, it's, the, it's the ultimate popular reason. And when people say, well, you know, we couldn't do that. The, 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 the Swiss are used to it. They, you know, they, they, they've become an educated electorate because they've had decades and decades of things. Well, everyone has to start somewhere. A great Indian economist, Tamatya Sen, once said, don't ask if a nation is fit for democracy. It becomes fit through democracy. The more people become accustomed to deciding these things, the more responsible they become in consequence. So I, I, I would certainly do that. Uh, uh, and I go for the whole Swiss deal, not just the Swiss relationship with the EU, but the, the localism, the direct democracy. I think they've got a, they've got a great thing going on in Swiss. In terms of are we still going to be there uh, as friends and allies of uh, our Czech Conservative colleagues after October. Look, it's possible. I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you for sure what was going to happen. I had no idea. When I accepted Martin's kind invitation, I had no idea that I'd be in the middle of another campaign myself. I thought it was finished. You know, now I don't know what's going to happen. All of my stuff is packed up in my office in Brussels. I just come back or not. I don't know. Right? I don't know if I'm going to be re-elected next week. If I am re-elected, I don't know if it's going to be until October or until next year. I do know, though, that in the long run, we cannot go back to how it was. You cannot wish away something on the scale of the referendum which saw more people vote leave than have ever voted for anything else in British history. So the only way in which I could see a continuing institutional relationship with the kind that you touch on would be, and it's, it's unlikely, but I have to allow it, it's just possible, maybe a different kind of commission, a different parliament, different people, it is just possible that in Brussels people might finally ask themselves one or two more searching questions. Because there will now, one assumes, be a different kind of commissioner appointed from Austria, from Poland, from Hungary, from Italy, and so on. And maybe, maybe it's possible that a conversation will begin where some of the Eurocrats will say, oh, perhaps we should have listened a little bit more carefully to what David Cameron was saying before. But maybe, you know, we, we never really thought that a leave vote was a possibility. Maybe we should look a little bit uh, more closely at those ideas now. What about that idea that Hofstadt had and that De Gaulle had about associate membership where you should... Maybe it's time to, to blow the dust off that. In that situation, to be honest, if we, if, if we were having a referendum on something different, 
on a different relationship. And you know, I think it's very likely that it would go in favour of a new deal. But there's no way that we can stay in having voters leave the existing one. If that's the only thing that is on offer, then it's just a question of when we leave, not if. We have time for one more question. There was you know, already uh, Thank you, Daniel, for coming to that. I have a question. Why do you think that the margin for a referendum was so small? Why could it be 10% more? Mm. And, what, and what is this related to this disconnect of the uh, representatives uh, for the people? Sure. Well, I mean, these things are relevant. So 17.4 million people voted to leave, which is, as I was saying just there, is, is more than whoever voted for anything. Uh, and the margin, 1.4 million, is a, is a, a not, you know, it's what the French would call an important sum. It's, it's 1.4 million is it. But I agree, 52-48, that to me is a mandate for a phased and partial recovery of sovereignty, not a mandate for a And one of the, one of the odd things is, very often the leavers in the UK say the problem is we had a Remain Prime Minister. And that's true, but not in the way that they mean. The truth is not that Theresa May was secretly trying to frustrate the referendum or something. There's no way that you can look at her behavior and conclude that. The truth was that because she had been a Remainer, she had to overcompensate on some symbolic but ultimately quite unimportant issues. So she drew all her red lines on what she thought were the really important things that would appeal to leaders, particularly immigration control and leaving quickly. And she didn't really draw the red lines on the issues of sovereignty and commercial flexibility where, where she should have done. And this, I'm afraid, is what happens when somebody is, is driving a machine designed by somebody else without really any idea of, 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 of how it's supposed to work. She, she seems genuinely bewildered. She says, but I'm delivering leave, I'm delivering border control. And she, she just doesn't really understand that that wasn't what was the, the, the chief motive for most leavers. But, I mean, to answer your question, if I mean, what, could it have been a, a bigger margin? Well, Milton Friedman had this great phrase, the tyranny of the status quo. The tyranny of the status quo, by the way, is what explains why big corporations always oppose any change of any kind because they've learned how to do well out of the existing system. And the tyranny of the status quo is part of how our brains work. We are a, a risk-averse species. There's a mountain of behavioral psychology about this. Uh, we are, we are loss-averse, we're, we're much happier when we find a, a 20 pound, uh, uh, sorry, much, much more upset if we drop a 20 pound note than we are happy if we find one. You know, we, we, we irrationally overvalue existing possessions. That was the single biggest argument for the Remain campaign. It's why most referendums go against change in every country on any issue. It's always possible to say, if you don't know, vote no. Just, you know, hang on to what you've got. We can always come back to this. Uh, of course, once we're out, the status quo for this. And that's why any chance of coming back in is just fanciful. And I think that the people who have looked at this know it, really. There's, there's, there is no scenario where having left the UK would then come back in.
all the staff here who look to make this possible. And as we, as we said many times, we've planned this event to happen after Brexit. Uh, Brexit hasn't happened yet, but I still believe it will. it's inevitable in one form or another, and sooner or later. I'm hoping for sooner, but uh, we shall see. We are happy that uh, Mr. Hannan found the time to be on TV this morning and then come, come here to Prague for the, for the event. And we are happy that the 2018 Liberal Institute Award goes to men who champions deregulation, decentralization, free markets, free trade and the rule of law. In the year of rising tensions in international trade and possibly in the year of Brexit, it's still possible. We couldn't think of a man better suited to this award than a free trader and Brexiteer like Mr. Han. So, officially now, the Liberal Institute Annual Award 2018 for contributing to the proliferation of ideas of liberty and free competition for honoring private property and the rule of law, Mr. Daniel Han, please.